we're on air. Um, 94 p participants are there. Sean Ogilvy, hello. Welcome, everybody, who have joined us for this uh, webinar launch of, of Everett Claynance's fabulous book. I mean, you won't get characters like this anyway, but we'll talk about it now. Hitler's Spies, Secret Agents, and the Intelligence War in South Africa, published by Jonathan Ball, and available at the Daily Maverick Bookshop, and uh, I'm sure everywhere else. Um, uh, let's just begin by um, uh, introducing, I'll introduce you, Everett, and, and, and then a little thing might come up just to sort of solidify that in, in script, is you're a senior lecturer in the Department of Military History at the Faculty of Military Science at Stellenbosch University. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm so glad you're looking forward to it. Ray, hello. Lynn Morris, hello. There you go. You can have a look at, uh, at Everett's uh, pedigree there. Um, this, this this book of Everett's is fabulous because it's a, it's it's a deeply researched account of the extent of the Axis intelligence networks in South Africa uh, during the Second World War, and that's that is what I thought really found fascinating. I think uh, just intelligence itself uh, and how it's developed since then. But the Axis powers, for those of you who might not know, and I think all of you probably do know, were Germany, Italy, and Japan, uh, and of course the allies were Britain, the U.S., and Europe. Um, this, uh, the, the book also provides for us, I think, an insight that I haven't had before of British military or British intelligence in South Africa as well, because we had our own peculiar circumstances um, at the southern tip of the world. And of course, between all of this, this look at uh, British intelligence, the look at the counterintelligence by uh, people supporting the Axis powers, and we'll talk about them now, is a cast of unbelievable characters. Um, like them or not like them, they're maverick, they're Nazi supporters, they're determined to serve Hitler in one way or another, uh, and, and, and Germany's intelligence needs. And we can speak later on about why um, you know, there was a leading towards doing that. And it, it makes perfect sense if you look at it now, not whether it's right or wrong is, is irrelevant. And we'll get to finally tracking them down towards the end, what happens with them. Um, and I'm sure you will talk later about some of the key characters and, and, and who they are. So I think a lot of post-war historians might just think that South Africa or Nazi spying activities at this corner of the world is kind of a sideshow, really, and not 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 important, and that it didn't really contribute to significant Allied losses uh, or to any kind of, I suppose, advantage um, of the Second World War. Um, uh, but uh, what Everett's done is had a look at formerly classified files on the Nazi supporting uh, cultural group, the Osava Brandbach, and its leader, Hans van Rensburg. And, and the book then tells a fuller story about these characters and how they go about trying to make contact with Germany. Um, it's just important to bear in mind that for the Osava Brandbach and those Afrikaner nationalists, that a victory by Germany was important to them for their own power. So ultimately, I think what, what is driving them is their own sense of self-survival, and it cannot be happening within the British imperial um, purview. So it, 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 it makes sense then that this group of people would then support the Axis powers. And also it was Germany, too, who first approached the opposition National Party and the Urbia, or the Osoba Brandbach, to work for them. And of course, they found fertile ground there. Um, Eva, just set out for us a little bit the historical relationships between Germany, uh, its meaning for some Afrikaners, and in the context of British imperialism, and what is the relationship um, like with Germany uh, in the 1930s and towards the mid-1930s, so that people can understand where this um, uh, dovetailing starts to happen. Thanks, Marianne. Uh, I think the relationship between the Afrikaners and the Germans, you can take it back a couple of centuries to some of the settlers, the German settlers that came to South Africa, and some of the connections that they, that they had to some of the South Africans. And then during the South African War, the Anglo Second Anglo Boer War, there was also some German, uh, what do you call them, volunteers that fought on the side of the Boers. The Boers were obviously always hoping that some other European power would come to their assistance, hopefully Germany. It never materialized. And then shortly after that, the Union of South Africa gets established. The First World War breaks out, and all of a sudden, this new South Africa is thrown into the war on the side of Britain, fighting against the Germans. The Afrikaners and the Germans always had good cultural ties uh, with one another. It angers some of the, the Afrikaners. We see the, the full-scale Afrikaner rebellion breaking out in South Africa because of this. And... Uh, South Africa invading Namibia, German Southwest Africa, then fighting against the Germans, conquering the territory. Anyway, after the war, we see that um, Namibia is then handed to South Africa as a mandate, mandated territory to govern. 
it obviously angers the Germans. They were hoping that they could still get this territory back some way or another. During the interwar years, between the First and the Second World War, there's cordial relations to an extent between South Africa and Germany. But at the back burner, Germany um, always wants, uh, has the idea that they might one day get back their territories. And uh, when, when Herzog came to power, um, and then when Hitler came to power in 1933, this drive to re reacquire their, 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 their territories, the lost territories, sort of came to the forefront again. And yeah, I think you've got this interesting dichotomy in the parliament there because you've got Herzog, which is very anti-war and neutral, neutrality. And you've got Smuts, who's sort of pushing for more active South African involvement should a war break out. And, uh, and I just think it made for such an interesting relationship between the South Africans and the Germans. And, it, and, and later on, at a point, the, the Germans realized, well, listen, yeah, we're never going to get back these territories unless we probably go to war and could re reacquire the territory or, or, or occupy it, they could get it back. So, um, but the, the, this affinity between the Germans and the Afrikaners remained because in September 1933, the war breaks out. Smits wins, oh, well, Smits wins the, the, the vote in parliament. And now South Africa is again fighting against Germany. But now there's a far bigger part of the South African society that's in favor of Germany or um, in favor of rekindling their ties or keeping their ties with the Germans. So this obviously adds impetus to a movement like the Osava Brandfach, who's against the war, that could mobilize the Afrikaner support using these sort of cultural ties with Germany and playing off the, this ideology the whole time to, to ga gather more support. So South Africa divided straight down the middle, those supporting the war in Smuts and those against the war and mainly pro Osava Brandtwach and sort of national party as well. And so you see then also in, the, in 1934, as you say, 1933, uh, th there's an increase in, in uh, communication between Germany and, and South Africa, or Afrikaners in South Africa, or the government actually. Uh, Oswald Puro visits Berlin. In fact, he sees, he, he meets uh, Pubels and Goering. So, um, um, and, and I think that they, what were the Germans, what did the Germans, you see, the, uh, the ships, Allied ships passed, you know, around, we, we had that ship stuck in the Suez Canal the other day and we saw the result of that, what, yeah. what happened around shipping. So here you have a situation in war where Allied ships are going to be using the Cape route in order to transport, um, there's merchant ships that are going past that, uh, you know, so, you know, while people might have thought South Africa is not a strategic point and that the Germans might have wanted to to use it as a base to reclaim Southwest Africa, German Southwest Africa. It actually, South Africa does come to play an important role in terms of um, establishing some sort of intelligence network uh, to thwart allied um, uh, movements or an allied offensive uh, or defensive or whatever it is. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, the network that was established um, uh, in Cape Town, well, started in Cape Town in the harbour, in a sense, and we'll get mm. later on to the number of ships that actually were destroyed as a result of that, because I think we really people haven't really had a look at that. Um, so the network gets set up um, it more or less when during the war? Sort of, uh, is it at the outbreak, or when does it start? To, when does it begin? So, so the actual German network, one could say, it only really gets established from about 1940 onwards, but. The, the real question that one has to ask yourself is why did they want to do it? And it all has to do with intelligence. So the Germans, um, because the Cape of Good Hope occupies such a strategic uh, position in the global shipping network, if, uh, well, sorry, not if, when Italy entered the war in June 1940, shipping could not pass through the Mediterranean anymore because the Suez can, because of the Italian territories controlled all down the coast of Africa, shipping could not pass through the Suez Canal. So everything was going to come around the Cape of Good Hope from the Americas and Europe to the far east and back. So all of a sudden, Cape Town and these shipping routes around the South African coast is propelled into like uh, great significance and of strategic value. And up to that point in the war, uh, German uh, uh, submarines and raiders had not really operated in South African waters. So if they could, if they could obtain accurate intelligence on the situation or the shipping situation in, in, in South African waters, they could launch a, a quick attack, a decisive attack, and and sink 
maybe bring the shipping lanes to a standstill, bottleneck Cape Town Harbour or Durban Harbour, and then the submarines can have a field day. So first of all, they wanted uh, naval intelligence and then, of course, political intelligence, because as we mentioned now, uh, previously, you had this activistic element within the Osovo Brandbach that was decidedly anti-war. And if uh, the Germans could get uh, an insight on, 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 well, a link to these people and an insight of the political situation within the country, they could probably use propaganda to thwart the Allied war effort or at least the South African war effort and, and you know, get enough uh, support for the anti-war movement as well. So anyway, that, that just being that, but uh, the, the movement really gets established in, in, in 1940. The earliest um, espionage grouping, or the German espionage grouping, as I write in the book, not much is known about them because not much exists. There was a, a dock a worker, um, uh, forget forget his name. I'm That's a how... it in the book. It's okay. You've That's got lots of yeah, yeah. A dock worker. Um, <laughs> and uh, and he is recruited by a by a German student work, uh, studying at GCT who is in contact um, with the German uh, espionage network in South Africa, and he's told to. Um, to, 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 to keep tabs on all of the shipping coming in and out of the Cape Town Harbour and then report this every night from Somerset West towards the Halderberg Mountain. And but but this guy, Hendrik Hickman, doesn't know doesn't know he doesn't know much more than just his little role in this network. Uh, he only knows who his handler was, but he doesn't know where the intelligence went on after that. But um that let's, being that, let's, yes. Let's just, uh, let's just uh, set out for people perhaps that Lorenzo Marx, or then uh, Maputo not today, Lorenzo Marx in Mozambique, there was the German consul was there, and that was the area where the Germans had established, I think, the uh, what would you call it, the, the, the portal to the attempt to set up an intelligence network in South Africa. So, so yes. if people are wondering where, you know, if he's, if he's broadcasting into the Helderberg Mountains, that you know, is it is it ending up in? In LM, as we used to call it then, or I, I don't know if you know, but um, yes. I think I think tell us then a little bit about some of the characters um, who who then enter the the, the story and who become uh, uh, you know part of a rolling you know conflict-ridden, difficult uh, uh, attempt to claim yeah. and, and and with everyone with different different agendas. But let's start off with I suppose Hans Rusebloom. Tell us a little bit about Hans Rusebloom, uh, and and we'll get to the the Osava Brandbach as well, but um, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, just uh, I think the first character is just a little bit maybe before Rusebloom is uh, this couple called Willem Marie Kirad. Yes, that's right. The, the broadcasters. Who, yeah, <laughs> who, who find themselves stuck in Germany at the outbreak of the war. They are decidedly anti smuts as well, and 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 South African Party. So they start working for the German radio station uh, Radio Ziesen, and they start pro uh, broadcasting Afrikaans propaganda back to the Union. So. They're involved in the German war effort by hook or crook. So the Germans realized that they wanted to send an agent back to South Africa to make contact first with the National Party, not with the Osama Brandfach. So right. they, they get Mariki Radley, they sign her up, she agrees to it, she memorizes a message that she's got to deliver to DF Malan, and off she goes, she gets to South Africa, can't deliver the message, it ends up with Hans von Rensburg and the Osama Brandfach. Next, a couple of months later, her husband also takes the journey, same message. And again, this message first ends up with Hans van Rensburg before it gets to the National Party. So we can already see that the Oswald Brandbach, according to me, they wanted to control communication with Germany. Um, when this sort of link didn't really materialize, the Germans next dispatched uh, Hans Rosebom, who was the, the first, I would say, the real agent that probably came to South Africa. Now, he had been a, a naturalized South African. He was of German, uh, German birth. And he, he, um, he was recruited by the Abwehr, the German uh, military intelligence, to come to South Africa and make contact, uh, uh, well, to come to South Africa and report on the political situation within the country. He arrives back here. Uh, it's all hunky-dory for, for a few months, and then he's, uh, he's, he's interned. Because of where, where, uh, does, where does he arrive? He arrives via he comes via he's, ship. Yeah, he comes sort of. He comes, yeah, he, they, yeah uh, lands at Cape Town, and um, he had a bit of a big mouth. I think he he talked too much, and eventually the police pick pick up on his uh, on his little adventures in Germany <laughs> as the war broke out. But they aren't aware that he's a German agent. And uh, anyway, he's in turn because of being a German national, and in the camp he makes a connection with some Oswald Brandbach members. And he says, well, 
he can start help them um, communicating with Germany or establishing a link of sorts. And he manages to pull off a miraculous feat where he, he dispatches a coded message via courier to Lorenzo Marx from Maputo and Mozambique. It goes from there to Berlin and makes its way back again over Radio Ziesen. And these guys are like, this is our man. He can, he can make it work. And uh, next, they, they help him then to escape. And he sets up a sort of a, a rudimentary uh, intelligence organization within South Africa. Um, and, but and before, before you can carry yes. on, uh, tell us a little bit about the equipment they were using, because if you think about it, they weren't, you know, in any formal, uh, uh, you know, service in this, in this such, and were operating outside of it. So, so yeah. what, what, what did they use? Wires and hangers, and you know, what did they use? Uh, was this, was this equipment just readily available, uh, or did they make it themselves? So, so in initially, I mean, uh, the Rosewim, him and he, his crew, they were very rudimentary in in terms of the the equipment that they used. There was no real radios involved. Um, they they would listen in or gather gather intelligence. They would listen in. At, oh, sorry, they did have a radio transmitter eventually, but it was very rudimentary. There was no real secret codes being used. They often just used Morse code and then transmitted the intelligence to Lorenzo Marx via an open channel. So it, it wasn't very sophisticated, but there wasn't anything around to, to challenge, you know, to, to, in competition. So uh, it, it was obviously the best thing on the market mm -hmm. at that mm -hmm. moment. And they could help the, the Oswald Brandwach uh, get into contact with the Germans, which the Germans wanted contact with the Oswald Brandwach and the Oswald Brandwach wanted contact with Germany. Yeah. So, but, but so somehow, we, yes. I, I, th I think what's interesting then is that you 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 have Rosebuhm and then you have Hans van Rensburg, who is the leader of the of of the, the Urbia, Oseb Brandbach, yeah. who's a very strong character. And yes. already then you can start seeing that there's. I mean, now in hindsight, we can see there was going to be trouble between the two of them. Um, so so what happens uh, uh, between uh, Rosebuhm, uh, Rosebuhm and and uh, Van Rensburg. I mean, what 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 starts to happen? When does it start to get off the ground? Uh, initially, initially, I think it was it was a good relationship. It was a working relationship. But um, the the problem came in with the nature of intelligence that was being passed through. So Hans van Rensburg always maintained that he would not pass through intelligence that could endanger the lives of South African troops. So if there was a ship traveling up the coast with South African troops destined for Madagascar, North Africa, Italy, wherever that intelligence wouldn't be passed on to Germany, so he didn't want South Africans to lose their lives. However, Roosebohm, who was neutral, he didn't care. He wanted to report on the most accurate and up-to-date political and military intelligence that could help the German war effort, where uh, Van Rensburg was a lot more moderate, um, uh, moderate in terms of the intelligence that was passed through. So this is where the crack starts then, because... The also for Brandwach realizes that they want to have complete control over the intelligence that's being sent to Germany, and they didn't want to have an intermediary like uh, Hans Rosebohm dictating what intelligence is being passed. And this is where the fissures and the cracks start. And uh, there are some other agents that appearing on the scene that we'll talk about in a few minutes. But then yeah. uh, Rosebohm just gets uh, sidelined. They 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 um, the the also for Brandwach actually extracts a code book from him. And uh, and he sort of becomes persona non grata all of a sudden overnight. He's no longer the the, the contact, the preferred contact. It yeah, he's, it he's I, throws I think, it out. I think we should we shouldn't forget and overlook at this point actually somebody who everybody knows in South Africa who in 1936, Roby Labrant, who was a member of the Autobahn Brandbach. Let's not forget him, who uh, uh, went he went to Berlin in 1936, and there, like many others, including Oswald Piro, I think, and and other leaders, were very impressed with what what what, the, what Hitler was doing. I mean, they saw it as this extraordinary pulling together of the nation, you know, yeah. fighting this imperial Britain. Um, yeah. So so Roby Labrant is back in South Africa, but he you know and uh, he was in the Osova Brandbach, but he he's so much of a rebel that he sets up his own, uh, I mean, eventually, uh, you know, um, he joined the Wehrmacht, uh, actually. Yeah, look, I, it's, I stand to be corrected, but he was never a member of the Osova oh, okay. Brandbach. Okay. Um, but, <laughs> but um, he, look, I think South Africa has a fascination with Roby Labrandt. Um, what he did was, 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 very uh, interesting. I mean, traveling all the way down south, infiltrating South Africa, 
Um, but but I think he was he was more militaristic and activistic than even the Oswald Brandtwach wanted because he he ra- arrives and he tells Hans von Rensburg the Germans sent him to take over the Oswald Brandtwach. Right. You sort of get on with life. I'm taking over, and um, and then uh, you know there's just uh, these guys don't get along and eventually they they uh, they sort of rat him out and uh, Robbie Leibrandt uh, gets arrested and. Uh, Fortunately, well, I don't think fortunately, but he's removed from the scene quite quickly because he doesn't really have a bearing on the intelligence war. That, no, well, that's my argument. Yeah. He yeah. he was like a, a rabble rouser. Um, he was a, he was like an early version for of a popul- populist populist yeah. nationalist yeah. kind of Nazi, so, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, so so okay, so okay. so, so he wasn't really him, part aside. of the intelligence war. Yeah. yeah, but but anyway, he was he was on the scene, but he was not really part of the the intelligence war, according to me. Okay, so tell me then a little bit about. Um, so the Germans wanted, um, uh, I, I suppose, a fifth column in South Africa as well. They wanted to stir trouble, uh, I suppose, between groups and others because that's how intelligence functions in a way. You know, you know, the more chaos you cause, sometimes perhaps the the, the better the intelligence or the better the advantage. So tell us a little bit about some more of the other the other characters who are very important to us. I mean, we can talk about the Verts Network. He's the Consul General in. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. tell us about the codename Hamlet, Lambertus Alferink. Is that is that the next uh, one who I, drops into our? our I, I think I think if one focuses quickly or just on Mozambique, um, this yeah, was sort please. of where the main the main drivers were initially of the German espionage networks in Southern Africa. So you have two two characters there. You've got uh, Leitpold Wertz, which is like the the consul. Mm-hmm. Uh, a consul there, or one of the senior diplomats, and he he runs the whole German espionage network in 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 Mozambique, and they dispatch agents to South Africa. They are the ones that uh, initiate contact later on with the with, with the Oswald Brandfach through uh, Felix, who we will talk about, and then um, there's also a further intelligence network operating in, in Maputo, which was, I mean, it was a it must have been a, a quite a like a place to go, uh, um, Joel, because it was there was spas, there was booze, there was pianos, and in the hotel, and everything was just going lacquer. And um, so the Italians also had a had a um, network operating there that, uh, by with uh, under the leadership of Umberto Campini. So Maputo, Mozambique, was this sort of hotbed of spas and intrigue, and. Uh, what, before we get to Al Frank, the next person I think that that deserves to be mentioned is uh, is this guy called Lothar Zittig, who the Germans then dispatch to South Africa. So Zittig, he arrived in South Africa in the interwar period. At the outbreak of the Second World War, he's also interned. He later on escapes, makes his way to Cape Town, contacts okay, uh, Oswald. When, when you must just, I must interrupt to say, because when you say he later escapes, I think people will, will be astounded when, because you actually recreate how they escape. You know, I mean, that, <laughs> yeah. that, that shows you, I mean, it's so interesting too, because you're interned in this camp, you're a spy, you're a, uh, and these guys manage to get out every time. So I just wanted to let people, readers know that that part of the book is fascinating, these, you yeah. know, how, how they absolutely are determined to get out of those camps. So this guy wasn't initially a spy. I mean, he, he, he wanted to get back to Germany and join the war effort. So the Oswald Brandtwach helps him get to Mozambique and when he's there, he doesn't get to go to Germany. So the next thing he says, he goes to Wertz and he says, I want to play an active part in the role. Can you use me? And uh, they then, this is at the time where the uh, Van Rensburg and Rissebum now is a fallout with one another. So they decide, okay, it's your. we're going to dispatch you to South Africa you have to go set up personal contact with Van Rensburg, deliver a new secret code, and then the next big, big, uh, big thing is try and establish direct radio contact with Germany. So this guy's got like a, he's got like a little checklist that he's got to, he's got to perform, and uh, the, the, the uh, he smuggled back into South Africa from Mozambique. He's caught, <laughs> and he's interned again, and eventually he escapes. Um, which is obviously described in much greater detail in the book, which is quite an ingenious way how he escaped the second time around from the camp. And then um, establishes contact uh, contact with uh, Van Rensburg, the Oswald Brandtwach, and they they steal a machine from a hospital in Bloemfontein, and they get a guy from the post That's office right. to help them, yeah, yeah. and they build this uh, uh, amazing um, radio transmitter. 
I see how Brian. Does, Brian Austin's in the chat here, and he's written a great article about okay. the 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 physics and everything behind how they built this uh, transmitter and how they transmitted the so, so the intelligence. A, it would be had supporters also, uh, which I think spooked the, the union government, you know, in, in, in all government departments. As you say, the post office, the Cape Town Harbour. I suppose it's a bit like now, where you don't know who you're working with and why they're there, um, yeah. in a way. But uh, So that's, that's important to sort of set out, because, I mean, a lot of the civil service were Afrikaans-speaking uh, South Africans, and a lot of them had been forced to, earlier on, take the oath to the Crown and the Queen. So it was a very difficult environment for those people, and they would have gladly spied on behalf of whoever but anyway so they steal this thing from the hospital yeah they've um, got the, they've got a they've got a guy uh Reyer grunewald from uh, the post office who knows how to to build these things uh, to uh, help build this uh strong enough radio that can uh, transmit the uh, the intelligence and they build this transmitter and they located in freiburg in uh in ooh, what, what would it be northwest Transvaal, yeah, eh? yeah the old western Transvaal, yeah oh. Northwest, and they build this um, this transmitter, and first they just start transmitting directly to Mozambique, making contact with Vats and his setup, and then later on, this transmitter is now strong enough to transmit directly to Berlin. So now the Osvald Brandwach is able to even sidestep Maputo and Vats and directly transmit intelligence to 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 Berlin, and also receive uh, communication back from there. So this two-way Communication is established by by the by this uh, Felix network. Um, the code name for Lothar Zetich was Felix, so I call yeah. it the Felix Felix network Felix yeah. organization. What were, they, what, were they what were they transmitting apart from the shipping movements? What, what, you know, uh, one would would expect. I don't know nowadays if you if you had a photograph taken with yourself with the Rhino Poach's wife in a in a spa, that would be intelligence that could be used against you. But yeah. uh, so what, what what were they sending and was it of use at that point? And uh, you know, I think if one looks at when the two way communication was established, um, naval intelligence surely was not of no use anymore because at that stage the German Navy had ceased to really operate in South African waters. So the naval intelligence, not, not so much. And also, um, one has to think of how these uh, networks operated. So if a guy, a civil servant to the harbour in Cape Town was reporting on the movement of shipping, they didn't phone phone one another and relay the, the, the intelligence. It was dispatched with the train, and then the train would now travel all the way up South Africa, and then it would get to Joburg, it would be sent to Pretoria and then to Hans van Rensburg and then from Hans van Rensburg to the Freiburg station and then they would transmit it. So by the time it arrived in Berlin and it was moved again onto Wilhelmshaven or wherever where the U-boat uh, Dönitz, Carl Dönitz was sitting and it was broadcasted back to the U-boats, many days could have passed and that ship could have traveled many hundred miles in many different directions. So the naval intelligence, not so much, but political intelligence, Obviously, if the Germans wanted to cause sedition in the country or keep their tab on what was happening in terms of the anti-war movements, um, then I think they were partly successful in transmitting the political intelligence. But what uh, what was the value thereof? Um, it's it's debatable. Well, we can it's talk debatable. about that. We can talk about that because you know, towards the end of the book, what you do is you track the the commissions that go to Germany and, and post-war Europe. To find, uh, you know, supporters of uh, Nazi supporters and and bring them back to, you know, in, or bring back the information with some object of, of, um, uh, I think, holding these people to account. Um, uh, I was just also we just go back to Lorenzo Marx again in Maputo because there's Paul Tromke who is the the consul general there as well. And yeah. at, at some point, you're right, he had about a hundred agents working working for him as well. So that's that's quite a lot of uh, activity in that spot. Yeah, yeah. Look. Tromke was sort of the nominal head. He was like the figurehead. He was like the queen. Let's call him the queen. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. uh, Vertz, Vertz was old uh, Bojo running the show. And uh, um, so Tromke was a nominal head figure. He was obviously in the loop on how things uh, worked, but uh, it was mainly uh, Vertz who was the, the guy calling the shots. But if we talk a bit more about the intelligence that they transmitted, um, the, the one report uh, that they sent through was on the consumption of potatoes in South African camps. Now, I don't know what 
what they expected the German war effort to do with that information. I mean, maybe they could figure out that South Africans like, like eating potatoes, yeah, chips, boiled potatoes, whatever, mash. So I don't know what they would do with that. But the political intelligence, um, at that stage, Hans van Rensburg was not allowed to, his speeches weren't allowed to be published in newspapers. So what they did was they transmitted um, his speeches back to Germany and then it would be broadcasted via the radio, uh, radio yes, and back to South Africa. So it actually became, it served more of a propaganda role than anything else. It was um, a bit like Twitter. It was like the early versions of Twitter yeah, where you could directly like communicate. It was like, you know, yes. and then yes. obviously it became, you know, um, I just wanted you to quickly just go back quickly. And I've got here that sort of the, 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 the attacks on, on allied merchant ships. Uh, if, we could, if you could just quantify in a sense, because so far as we've been speaking, we hear that you know the intel's being sent and they're wanting to understand the political landscape. Maybe the potatoes thing was to sort of cut off the supply of potatoes and make us hungry, or I don't know what I mean, any what evil yeah. plan they would have concocted yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. But in you actually in the book you have you 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 um you you list a name and uh, the the number of, of uh, the you know the effect on shipping uh, of this intel. So just tell us a little bit about if, if you've got it, the figures at hand, kind of, so people can understand also what was being translated. I've, I mean, I've got your book here. I'm just, just find the page. No, um, it's, what, I can, what, I, I can have a go. You can remember. You can open your drawers. Uh, so, um, what, yeah. what was, what was coming past and what, uh, what were the casualties at sea? So the, the, the big German submarine attacks actually start in October, 1942, and they launched the surprise attack um, in the harbor of Cape Town, and they sink many ships. And I think throughout the course of the war, from about 1940 to 1944-ish, when the last boat to sink, don't quote me on that, it's 153 ships that sunk in our waters. Um, mainly, mainly merchant shipping, no naval transports as such, but South Africa was, um, even if it wasn't uh, materials or raw resources from South Africa, there was a lot of obviously movement of ships up and down. So that would be transporting coal or gold or whatever you want. To use. I mean, boots, uniforms, fresh fruit mm -hmm. and uh, produce from South Africa onwards. So um, that anything that they would sink could affect the war effort in, in a certain way. But, but definitely the, the, the period where there was the major operations was sort of like from October 1942 to August 1943, when, the, when the, the German submarines really like was operating along the coast. I mean, the, the, the first U-boat was sunk between Dussin, just sort of on the other side of Dussin Island, which is, I mean, if you know where Azerfontein is, you look at Dussin, Dussin Island, it's just, it's just there. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, close. So, it's really close. Uh, I was quite the, shocked that yeah. they actually, I, for some reason, I, I hadn't held on to, and I'm really interested in, in, in the Second World War, that sh I suppose not, not in the South African aspect until now, that so many ships had been sunk in Cape Town Harbour just right here, you know. Um, yeah, um, I mean, you've got somebody, these great, you say, great accounts. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm just looking at this. Uh, uh, Ian from Glencairn says his father was a wartime Durban harbour pool. Harbour pool. Oh, I don't know. Uh, somebody asked what role did academics play. Not much, I don't think. Um, no. At this point, uh, in Potsdam, in Potsdam, yeah. there was a bunch of academics at the university that was very pro Oswald Brandfach and involved in the in 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 the movement. Yes, but not really yeah. in the intelligence yeah. war. No, not. Um, we now uh, uh, tell us a little bit in sort of to, so what's what starts happening as the war uh, rages on and South Africa is is part of the Allied offensive. Um, what starts to happen with with all of these characters inside South Africa? Because what they're doing is they're passing on information. Uh, they're not quite sure how it's being used or where it's being used. But but what is their own organisation doing with you know within South Africa to perhaps establish a post-war uh influence perhaps i mean uh and and the propaganda of, uh, is also i think at the time is the propaganda the crude racial nationalist stuff that the nazis are doing and and does that find traction somewhere uh with those particular afrikaners but look marianne i think by the end of 1942 sort of when the allied forces start landing in north africa and in the next year sicily is invaded and then it goes towards um towards uh, the invasion of, of europe 
I think, I mean, the Osava Brandtwach must have realized that, listen, yeah, the chances of a German victory on Axis victory in the war is now slowly but surely diminishing. They've been kicked out of Africa. The chance of a, a, of a German expedition sort of arriving and liberating South Africa is, <laughs> is has all but has all but yeah. faded. Can so, you imagine? Uh, I mean, eventually, contact between the Felix organization and, and Berlin is also it's also it also breaks up completely. So they don't even get that there's no two-way contact anymore. And uh, so I think these guys must have realized, look, the writing's on the wall. Um, we've got to we've got to sort of like see how we can disengage from this and get get the guys that were key or central to this into hiding because I mean. Rusebum, Rusebum sort of signs a deal with the government, and and he's provided some sort of a clem, clemency, but he could maybe report on, on uh, on on Van Rensburg, and 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 Zittig and and, and the, the grouping, and then Zittig also disappears for like a couple of years, where he's put into hiding. So I think they've realised that the writing's on the wall. The war's going to be almost uh, at an end, and we've got to make sure that we we get our house clean. And if there's any incriminating evidence, we've got to. We've got to get rid of it. What um, is what is the government's uh, uh, attitude like? Uh, attitude towards the Urbia? I mean, and, and when we say the government, we have to discuss who is it Malan or is it Herzog? I mean, what what is what so, is their feeling? Because they also have to hold on to as, uh, Afrikaner votes and I suppose Afrikaner aspirations at that time. And and here you have a competing, um, quite cons very very conservative and militant group of people. Um, Supporting the Nazis, uh, but it could cause political trouble for you if you do anything to. It's the same as the situation we sit in here now. We have, uh, you know, people who, if you move on them and put them in jail, you might cause insurrection. So you know, the more things change, the more things say the same. So the relationship, what is the <coughs> attitude towards the Wibia and and Hans in particular? So um, the Smuts government, I think. I mean, there's there's great speculation out there that uh, Hans von Rensburg was actually a a government planted, you know, a government yeah, right. plant. He was there <laughs> to have a moderating effect on the Osava Brandwag and prevent the sort of militaristic, activistic elements to try and sort of like calm them down. And he could control what sort of intelligence was passed. He would ensure that no South African troops would lose their lives and stuff like that. So that, that that's the one thing. So, I mean, realistically, they were a thorn in the side of the flesh of the Smuts government. But did they ever really challenge them? Um, in terms of overthrowing the government, uh, no, I don't think so. Everybody, uh, there's a lot of arguments out there that says that uh, the existence of this grouping within South Africa was enough to tie down uh, divisions of South African troops within the country. That's also nonsense. I mean, yes, there were troops stationed in the in the country, but that was part of the reserve manpower pool for for, for uh, eventual um, uh, dispatchment to the front line. So I. I think I don't think uh, I think they were tolerated because they weren't really considered to be uh, such a big threat. If the war had maybe gone a different way and it would have been, yeah. the campaign in North Africa was different, or in East Africa they didn't defeat the Italians, or the Japanese landed in Madagascar, sure, maybe a bit different. Yeah. Chantal Wiley asks a question: uh, What was the extent of pro-Nazi support in South African numbers? Um, she says she once went to a bed and breakfast with Carlos Dorf that had Mein Kampf and SS memorabilia in the library. Yeah, well, my father had Mein Kampf in his library too, wrapped in brown paper. Uh, but yeah, so what was the extent of the of the Nazi support? I I, I wouldn't say that it was uh, the whole of the Oswald Brandfach. I think that would that would maybe be taking it a bit too far. But there was definitely a, a significant number of members. Of the Osama Brandfuck that was pro-Nazi in, in the outlook and ideology, and 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 and, and sort of fell into the the nationalist socialist uh, frame of mind. So, but I don't think it was the whole of the of the Osama Brandfuck. Somebody's um, just asking if the book is available in paper format. Here it is in paper yeah, format. It is. <laughs> it's, it's, it, you can't swipe it. You have to do that with it. Um, it's available. It's also available as an ebook. As an ebook, uh, yeah. and and you can get it from the Daily Maverick Bookshop. Uh, there will be instructions on how to do that, or any other bookshop. Uh, yeah. If you want, you know, a weekend read of spies and spies and lies. And okay, let's walk. Let's work now towards the war ends. Of course, these guys, as you say, Felix has disappeared, smuggled somewhere, hidden away, like Tulani Dromo. Uh, uh, this is 
as Zuma supposed spy who's hiding out in Fazulu Natal. But anyway, let's forget about that. It's the same modus operandi years later. What happens after the war? Because now suddenly there is a search on in the Union for war criminals. And um, uh, there, there is, take us through uh, this little bit. You're saying that in 1945, there were talks about amending the mandate for South African search officers in Germany to locate uh, uh, servicemen who were in post-war Europe who might have collaborated with the Nazi regime. So, you know, that effort by the Allies afterwards, um, your description yeah. of that is, is wonderful because, of course, you're getting into post-war Europe and Berlin, Germany, ruined different sectors. You've got these two South Africans, uh, you know, who um, uh, the Rhine and Barrett mission. So tell us a little bit about uh, what happens after the war and what is the decision politically around war criminals and finding them as, you know, the so I, I think a lot of this plays off against the back backdrop um, of the of the Nuremberg trials that sort of happened post post war, uh, but then the South African government decides that they want a clean house. Um, everybody that was sort of opposed to them, that that were in any way collaborating with the uh, the German war effort, um, whether it was through actively assisting the German agents in South Africa, or whether it was South African prisoners of war in Germany that joined the the, the SS, one of these, uh, I forget uh, what they were, I forget the, the actual unit's name, or if they were stool pigeons in camps, whatever, anybody that was traitors or collaborators, they were going to, to start building cases of treason against them. So my book focuses mainly on the treason cases that were now being built against van, uh, Hans van Rensburg and the members of the Oswald Brandtwach that assisted him in this, in, in aiding the German war effort. So, um, I see somebody mentions the VATS telegrams here in the in the question. So, for, for what allowed the South Africans to build a case of treason against Hans von Rensburg? Since 1942, actually 1941, since when the period when Hans Rensburg started um, broadcasting intelligence to, to to Maputo, the Allies had kept tabs on everything these guys were doing. Okay, they had intercepted all of the uh, communication between South Africa and and um, Mozambique and then also between Lorenzo Marx and, and and Berlin so they had a complete picture of what was happening all of so the messages British, British sent there British allied intelligence in South Africa at the time was pretty good was was, yeah. was okay yeah and, and were the OB aware that they were being watched uh, or not is I, there any indication I, I don't think so I don't okay. think so. Sometimes when you're so close to the flame, you don't uh, you don't see the shadows. Mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, so w w what South, South Africa and I had to do is they had to go interview further um, people that can uh, that could corroborate this. So, so people like Vert, uh, Lambertus, Alfrink, uh, and some of these other agents that that had been active in South Africa. So they dispatch uh, the Rhine and the Barrett missions to Germany to go and collect this information. So you've got Great characters there: Rudolf Rhine, mm -hmm. Captain Bushy Jack Jackson because of his moustache, and then you've got Lawrence Barrett and and George Clutter Fisher, who later on wrote the book uh, Ob Traitors or uh, tra uh, Traitors uh, Ob, but don't no, no worry, he wrote the book. Patriot, Patriots yes. or whatever, yes. and uh, and these guys uh, go across uh, uh, Germany, Holland. And they're investigating, they're collecting just, documents. You, you, you know what I love about what you did is, is that you, you take us into what it must be like for Fisser and the others to arrive in occupied Berlin with these different sectors. And they are coming as South Africans to Europe looking for information from these different, uh, I mean, the, the Russian sector is run differently from the British sector, is run differently from the American sector. Um, so I'm just trying to, mind, in my mind, imagine this mission arriving in Europe uh, with with this not confusion, but this terrible bureaucracy, and and no. who is paying for this mission to go to Germany as well? Is it the government? Um, no, the South African you know, government, the minister, Ministry of Justice, and the Depart oh, Department of Justice and External Affairs, and then also the um, the Defence Force. Uh, so it's like a combined effort. So these guys go, they collect the necessary uh, evidence, they interview the suspects, and they build this case of high treason against Hans van Rensburg. And they, they even draw up a, a docket called uh, Rex versus Johannes Jans van Rensburg and members of the Oswald Brandtwach or something like that. But this happens, so this happens from about 1945 to 1947. And just when they're about to sort of go, move, move forward with these charges of high treason, 
the 1948 election now starts knocking on the door. And Smuts, the Smuts government is too reticent to move ahead with these treason trials because they are scared of what it might do to their electoral campaign and turn the, the Afrikaners against them. So they decide, let's, let's hang back and see what happens. If we win the election, we might move ahead with it. They don't win the election. Now, Dave Malan and the National Party come to power, and there had been seven, I think it is six or seven copies of this uh, Barrett yes, report. Barrett report yeah. And all of those are just, um, as soon as Malan comes to power, Sia Ashwart, who becomes a Minister of Justice, he calls, he says, I want all seven copies of this. So all seven copies of this report and all the appendixes that contained all of the communication between Germany and South Africa and the Oswald Brandfach and everything they had gets recalled and is deposited with the Minister of Justice. And we see that this matter is debated in the South Africa in the House of Assembly for a little bit. And how, is then, it, how is it debated? What is the what is the essence of the debate? Because in a sense, you would think that um, morally, uh, you know, as a government, you, you, you would you would you would go with where the rest of the world is going. You've got the United Nations you know, setting up the Charter for Human Rights. You've got knowledge of the Holocaust. You have you know knowledge of so much that has happened. You would think that on a moral ethical um, level that the government would say no. Actually, we we're going to charge these war criminals. We want to show the world they're not that. But they make a political decision not to do so. So that's that's. But you so, know. so because um, I mean, Dave Malan was partly implicated in this because right. the German government had reached out to him. I mean, they didn't want contact with Oswald Brandfach initially. They wanted it with DF Malan because they considered him to be the 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 the, the so-called uh, the next leader, leader that they wanted yeah. to work with. Sure. So, and then there's also some uh, a German agent called uh, Hans Denk. There's a the, the, it's called the Denk affair where they actually reached out and they they tried to contact Malan, which he he brushed off these contacts but i mean uh, the, he had still been involved so i think that's why it was sort of tabled in the house of assembly and discussed for a little bit maybe just to clear his own name but anyway i'll go into this quite quite in, in detail in the book but uh, this the this story then sort of it's 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 tabled in parliament it's discussed all of the copies have been taken malan says he handed it to the state archivist and then this thing uh we don't we don't hear of this again. Uh, George uh, uh, George Fisher's book makes mention of this. It actually tells a, a great part of the story. And what then, year is Fisher's book? What, what year does it come I think out? It's seventy six. So you must that have been late, late. you must have been quite old then already. Um, what and is then, the public's response to? Or the, oh, I don't know if you could see it because, of course, earlier on we were talking about how you were able to find yourself in the Oseva Brandwach actual archives um, because that you know not not that some of those uh, documents are classified but w could what was the general feeling in South Africa about this uh, you know it would be like the Zondo report coming out and then the Minister of Justice saying hand it to me and then you never see it again you know what I mean and then 20 years yeah. later it pops up in someone's drawer yeah so I mean the general feeling I think it depends on what side of the 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 coin you you, you are um, I think, I mean, I think Hans van Rensburg and and members of the Oseva Brandfach were wary of this moving ahead because, I mean, they knew they were implicated, and and the funny thing is in the Oseva Brandfach archive, he's hold you can find uh, sort of his defence that he that he tabled or that he wrote should the 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 case had been uh, should it have gone to trial, so in that document uh, he explains. Why, why he was involved, why he did it, why he would do it again. So uh, that's very he's interesting. He's, he's defiant in that. And also, I mean, I just wanted to say that actually, you actually, that 700 documents were discovered in, in the. So that's, yeah. that's a substantial amount of, of evidence. Yeah. You know. So, so, uh, so yeah. what, I, what I managed to find was I mean, I went to the South African National Archive and I was after this Barrett report, like, you don't understand. I mean, I've, <laughs> I can I've, imagine. <laughs> and I never, I could never find a copy of this full report. So what I did find initially was the administration files of this, the, of the the Barrett mission and the Ryan mission. So by using those documents, you could sort of pick up what was happening. But then on an like an off offhanded chance, whatever, I found a partial copy of this Barrett report at the Archive for Contemporary Affairs in Bloemfontein at the University of the Free State, but mm. 
it doesn't contain all of those, the, the addendums that contains all of these 700 supporting documents. So you've got the report, but you don't have the full story that, 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 you know, where you can see all of the communication between Germany and the Ossova Brandwach. So now tell, us, tell us, where does that report come from? Because, you know, in the end, of course, we, you know, you, you talk about, uh, we still do this in, you know, when you issue a report like the high level panel review uh, into state security, uh, X number of people get it. And that, uh, uh, that Providence trail is followed with that document. So interestingly, whose document was that that you found? So, so that, the, that was the final report drawn up by, uh, Lawrence Barrett and George Fisser of, of this Barrett mission on, on their findings and um, all of the evidence provided to the Minister of Justice, then Harry Lawrence. Okay, here, here it is. This is a strong enough case to move forward with uh, a, a charge of high treason. We've got, the, uh, we've got the documentary evidence. We've also got the um, uh, we're witnesses, sure, witnesses sure, sure, that we can bring. Yeah. yeah. No. Well, it's an official government document. It's it's mm. there. It's 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 sort of the final. Yeah. It's their final report. Um, but anyway, what what I realized was in the end that I didn't need that document to write the story because there wow. there was enough evidence available. So even, I mean, we can debate about this whether that document was uh, removed from public consumption or circulation or if it was lost or destroyed or whatever, doesn't matter. There's always enough evidence that survives. If you go scratch deep and hard enough, you can find it. And I found it with those administration files. And the Barrett report in the end actually just confirmed what I had known all along. So if they wanted that, and, to... And, and, and that copy that you located, was that the president's actual copy? His own it was, copy? It's so it, it must have been the copy that was handed to uh, the Minister of Defense, to C.R. Schwart, okay. which... It ended up in his private collection, so um, they were they were um, yeah. I mean, if that anyway, there's a great part there, in the book well, where there they. There is a great part. There is a great part. I've just brought it up because it's so yeah. interesting. How you know we've had this the prisoner nine one three where you also have documents that are state uh, that should be in the state archive ending up in the private archive of a minister, but eventually yeah. it, it comes out. I just yeah. wanted to see. Uh, uh, we've, we've only got about five, but uh, not very much time left. So, because so I, can I, 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 I please, I please wanted to yeah. comment. So uh, I see somebody mentioned. Uh, the supplying of German U-boats around right. the coast of South Africa. Yeah. Um, I found no documentary evidence on that. Um, if you, there's a little book written about it, or that's anecdotal. That's I would say it's best maybe anecdotal, but there's no hard evidence for it. Then I see um, Tony Heard talks here about was Felix maybe killed? He wasn't killed. He survived long he after survived. the war. And uh, the great thing was that the Oswald Brandwach archive interviewed um, both both uh, uh, Felix and uh, Rosebuem, and their interviews are available there. And uh, it's great; it makes for great listening. You hear uh, parrots in the background and, and tea being delivered as they're being interviewed. So that's wow. uh, that's, wow. that's quite 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 wow. quite interesting. And it and it obviously provided a counter narrative to what had been published before by British historians. They don't have access to the Afrikaans sources. Mm. So I was in mm. a fortunate position. Mm. Absolutely. I just wanted, before we go, just what, what do you think has been the lasting effect of the not uh, charging of Nazi sympathizers? Um, I mean, the extent of, of their so-called treason, or their treason, it wasn't so-called treason, their treason, uh, loss of ships around the harbor uh, 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 and others. But what is the long-lasting legacy of letting that go, letting it slip? I suppose pragmatically, maybe also because people, people were brooders, and they kind of. When you read Hans van Rensburg's statement, uh, you understand why certain kinds of people would support him completely. Look, I think uh, post nineteen forty eight, these guys were uh, geared up for Afrikaner, for working towards greater Afrikaner unity, working towards uh, a, a republic. Or getting the republic set up. So I think within the African community, it was maybe let bygones be bygones. Let's forget about this. We're all in one way or another implicated. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, I think they're lucky that they, <laughs> that they won the election. If it had been a different outcome, it might have been different. But then also knowing 
I don't think Smuts wanted to create martyrs. I, I think he was uh, yeah. really. And you speak about that in the book as well. You mean having to? It's almost. It's so yeah. weird because every time I read this, and there's no equivalent necessarily, but in terms of political decisions that must be made, that that work for the greater good. It's the same. The ANC sitting with Ace and other people. You've got to make decisions about what do you do with these people in your party. What is it? How does it affect yeah. you going forward? Yeah. So it's easy in retrospect to say you should have done something. But but what your book has done for me is as as opened up for me the various currents that led into it. it's a wonderful read it's 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 non-partisan it's 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 the stats it's the the the, the escapes it's the daring do it's the british uh, efficiency uh, you realize in the end they knew everything they had an incredible intelligence network uh, yeah. in south africa so yeah. the allies they were going to see the hatter anyway these guys in the long run you know yeah. <laughs> look look whether you like it or not or you, you know whether you're pro german or pro oswald brandwach whatever You've got to take your hat off to these guys. They achieved some, uh, these agents in South Africa achieved some interesting things. They had a lack of jolly adventure while at it. Um, but in the end, the Allies were aware of everything. Yeah, <laughs> listen, Tony, uh, I wanted to say to Tony, Tony, uh, uh, Felix is sitting and he, and he surfaced in South Africa in 1948. They found him uh, in 1948. So I think you should, and he was, as you say, in, in, uh, in, uh, on page 199, it was Van Rensburg, I think, who was uh, lived in the shadow of his own Nuremberg trial. So, yeah. so um, I, yeah. I really think, Tony, you will love the book. I know you will. Uh, yeah. And it might answer some questions for you. Yeah. Um, I just yes. see, Brian, last thing, Brian Austin mentions it there. He says the book will also be released in the UK. So if there's people uh, tuned in here, not, with, or not in South Africa, the book will also be released uh, in the UK and elsewhere. <laughs> okay, great. I love what yeah. Wanda Roos says here. Too. She says, as a history nunu, uh, I, I never even knew about all of this. How enlightening. So, you know, it is something we think we know. We've heard about it. And I think as history sort of drifts further away, we must try and bring it closer uh, and, and look at how it still impacts on us and attitudes today and cultural organizations, how they change. Uh, you can only know this history so we don't repeat it. So, ever thank you very much for a, a wonderful book. That's no, a great thank you. Um, really, and and, yeah. and all of those history news here as well. Please uh, get the book; it's available everywhere. Thank you for joining us on this webinar, and um, I hope to see you sometime and speak to you. And uh, person, you know, yes, share war stories uh, yes. <laughs> one way uh, or another. Thank uh, so you very, thank much. You very much. Thank you all of you for attending and your questions. Um, uh, and uh, get the book. That's all I can say. Have a great day, further and be safe. Wear masks and stay away from that Queen Corona. <laughs> bye, bye, everyone.